Hi everybody, I'm Tim from TroutandFeather.com and welcome to part two of a special two-part series with entomologist Matt Green. In part one, Matt completed a field stream sample and now in part two, you are going to see the results. If you missed part one, check out the description of this video and I'll provide a link down there for you to go back and check out that one. However, I know you all wanna see the results. They are right now, so sit back and enjoy. Okay, Matt, now we have a different kind of look. Will you tell everybody what happened after we came off the stream? Okay, so, Tim, after we came off the stream, I put the contents of our net, you know, whatever you saw, the sand, the debris, the bugs that are in that, into this uh, little Tupperware container here. I also placed the, uh, the watercress that we have over here in this small, plastic yeah. Tupperware container and so j just so it, it's you know it's got water in it, it doesn't kill anything but okay. and this is just the stream water I uh, yeah this just stream water and for what you could see these really fast moving uh, you call them animals if you want invertebrates these are amphipods these are they make up almost 75% of your total biomass in these true limestone springs. Uh, further upstream, where it's a little bit colder, they might be replaced by aquatic roly-polies, the isopods or the sow bugs. You might find those in just as high biomass, but a lot of times these amphipods, these scuds, their common name, you'll find them in riffle habitats like where we sample. Now, you see a lot of silt in here, a lot of debris. There are different mayflies, caddisflies, even some true fly families that we'll find in here. The different mayflies that you might find are, are sulfurs, the ephemerella mayflies, mm -hmm. uh, trichos or trichorithodes, you might find those. Uh, you might also find different kinds of heptogeneity mayflies. These are uh, flat, minnow, flat-headed minnow mayflies. They, they got, kind of look like small horseshoe crabs. And uh, they're in here, but you might also know those as the March Browns, the gray foxes, the uh, Stinicon interpretata mayflies, also called uh, orange cahills here locally. And, and what I hear you saying, you're, you're kind of giving us the Latin name? Well, and then also the common Latin name, is, is that? a common name, yeah, Tim. And you, you'll find those here in the stream that we just sampled. But then again, you'll also find different kinds of net spinning caddis flies. These are caddis flies that actually use silt to construct uh, house, houses, mm -hmm. structures that they then collect different kinds of detritus and algae and different organic matter in. Now right here, I don't know if you guys can see this, but we have a very interesting bug right here. This bug here. This is a granum caddis fly in its case. Jeez. Now what's interesting about the granums is you'll see emergence it typically around mid-April, sometimes to late April, depending on where you live here in the state of Pennsylvania. Further south, this may be earlier. This may be April 1st to April 10th. Uh, this, is, this is on the East Coast. For all those on the West Coast, you're looking at granum emergence in May. Tr closer to Mother's Day and in the south refer to this as the Mother's Day caddis fly because of that. That's the name came over uh, the Rocky Mountains over to the Appalachians. However, further north into New York you might see these granums emerge uh, earlier into May. Uh, I, I don't necessarily think they're down into to Mother's Day, Tim, you may correct me on that with your local experience here. No, it tends to be a little so earlier long. than that. It's, it's earlier than that, right? Now, for us to see that right now, is, is that just one stage of that 
regrant them or is it gonna regenerate a number of times or is that basically that, that house, that structure gonna be what it's going to live in until it's emergence next oh, season? Well, yes, that's true. That That's technically the larval form and the granum caddisflies, like all caddisflies, have uh, four stages. They have the egg, the larvae, the pupa, and the adult phase. And that means they're called holometabolous insects, so they have a complete life history. Insects that have an incomplete life history are called hemimetabolous insects. Uh, these insects have an egg phase and nymphal phase, although some entomologists are now calling it a larval phase, and an adult phase. And these insects are your stoneflies, your mayflies, anything without a pupal stage. Now I don't know if you can see this, however, we have a free living caddisfly here. This is a hydrocycid. It does not form a case, but instead forms a retreat like we discussed earlier. It, it looks kind of like a little grub almost. Let's see. Anyway, very interesting. And, and those are your modeled brown caddis flies. They can actually emerge just after the Mother's Day caddis or your granums. Uh, but they technically are what's called bivoltine normally. Sometimes they can be multivoltine, but they're normally bivoltine meaning they have two emergences in a year, two adult phases. Mm -hmm. These are going to be in the spring and the fall. Whereas there's the granum has one adult stage in the spring, meaning it's called univoltine. Multivoltine would be more than two. Why I mentioned the granum is this is very important to note for many of our waters on the East Coast and then even out West. Many people don't know that after the granum females lay their eggs, it only takes about three weeks for early in-store granums to show back up on the scene. Jeez. Granums just a, a four or five millimeters long might be in your home water. Now, why do you think that's, un maybe that's unimportant, Matt. Why would I ever want to know anything <laughs> about that? Five millimeter cased insect, oh, big deal. Not if they're there by the tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. Next time you're on your stream, your local water, and if you know a little bit about granum biology, right about the time you'd see the sulfur or the green drake on your local water, pick up grass, aquatic grass that almost looks just like the grass that grows in the right period. Looks like grass you'd plant in your front yard. It's in your streams, especially here in Pennsylvania. Go over to it, pick it up, and look at it. And I'm willing to bet money you might find case granums on that grass in mid-May. Matt, that's really cool information about the granums. The one thing I want to kind of pull back on and take a peek at, there are so many insects in that, in that container. It's just, it astounds me how alive that is right now. But for the sake of the viewer out there, when we look in there, we're seeing 50, 75, 100, but there's a lot of different sizes. Could you just give the viewer an idea of what's the range of sizes that you're seeing right now in the container on the right? Well, if you're talking about hook sizes, Tim, what you're going to see here is anything from, oh, probably about a 14 to maybe down to 24, 26. Okay. And, and that's why fly shops and a lot of folks tie and sell these really small uh, larval imitations of, of insects. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about briefly was the aquatic true flies that we have in here. And you know, this is summer town, but I see some black flies in here. Yeah. And you'll find black flies in some of your summer samples. One other point that I wanted to touch on is why do we do this? Why is this important? Why should I be interested in this? Something we never really quite ticked on mm -hmm. exactly. And that's well, by taking this sample, you have a very good idea of what's in here right now. I would encourage you to take seasonal samples, winter, fall, spring, and summer. I also would encourage you to take these insects that you find, preserve them with ethanol, uh, ethyl alcohol. You can use rubbing alcohol, that's perfectly fine. Small bottles are fine to store these insects in over time. They will keep very long, as okay. long as you change the ethanol out every, every couple of months or so at first, and then 
every year after about six months. Will that keep them color fast as well? Will that keep that true color? Not necessarily. There are different tricks to that, but we won't talk about okay. it per se. Some people use acetone, but that becomes a little bit difficult to find in the grade required. You need a high laboratory grade. Okay, so I, but, I hear you're, t you're basically saying that's another video in the future. Uh, two, but you can buy acetone at a place like Walmart, but that acetone is mixed with different things that are only going to do damage to your insects. Okay. So what I've always done is to simply write it down, and then when you place these insects in a vial for storage later, you can... Uh, write down or type out a printed label with the location information and what it is and in that label somewhere you can say this insect was brown okay. before I placed it in ethanol or this insect was orange and that way when it comes back to it you can say ah you know normally these pickled specimens are great for having size right there in front of you and distinguishing between features and identifying later if you really want to know color well Take a picture of it. That sounds great. Yeah. I think you've given us more than enough information to digest. Um, let's kind of change the camera angle one more time and we'll, we'll kind of wrap up this, okay? Sure. All right, thanks, Matt. All right, Matt, so we've done the stream sample. We've looked at the insects. For all the fishermen out there, what's the next step? Where do they take all this information? Well, Tim, I think that goes back to why are we actually doing this stream sampling in the first place? Why are we involved in this? If for somebody like me, it's twofold. It's being a professional entomologist, taking these samples to determine what kinds of environmental factors affect these aquatic invertebrates. The other fold to it is, as a, as a fisherman, as a fly fisherman, I want to know how to better imitate these insects. And it starts with the stream behind us. We go out, we sample these insects, we come back, we tie them, we develop flies to fish these insects uh, so we can better imitate the food items of trout and catch more fish. And that's, that's the biggest part of it and anybody can do this. It, you don't have to have an advanced degree. There are plenty <laughs> of easy to use resources out there. As some people might say, you want to match the hatch. And you can certainly do that, but you can also tie your own flies that imitate the general morphology and body types and profiles of some of these insects. You don't have to be complete whiz to do this. You just need a good net that won't float away. <laughs> that was very well said. The one thing that we want to point out for the purpose of this video, we're not sure when you're watching this, but we're completing this stream sample at the end of July. And I love that Matt said earlier in this when we were doing it, Hey, make sure you do this quarterly. Try to get out there every two or three months because we're on a limestone style stream right now. And maybe it's gonna be a little bit more consistent if we came back in April or if we came back in December. But on your local waters, it may not be. And you wanna make sure that you're doing your best to imitate those natural insects that are out there. Matt, any final advice or anything else to kind of wrap it up with your thoughts for everybody? Yeah, sure thing, Tim. The final goal to all of this stream sampling should be for you, the angler, to not ever do any more stream sampling. The final goal should be to conduct lots of sampling, build a reference collection, know what's there so when you arrive on the stream, based on habitat type too, for example, there are certain insects that only live in watercress, they only live in some thermal habitats, like this limestone spring creek behind me, that may not live anywhere else or live in other habitats with different conditions and lower bio biomass. So your ultimate goal, Tim, is to develop these collections and this information so you just arrive and you just go at it and have fun. And you might actually <laughs> figure out something that you never knew existed Very and develop cool. a newfound love. You just never know. So I encourage you to get out in your streams and sample. And in the process, you'll, you'll become a better fly fisherman. Trust me, Matt is one for sure. Um, the one thing that we did want to mention, Matt has done presentations, he's done demonstrations of these stream samples. If your group is interested in something like that, or maybe your Trout Unlimited, or your, we'll say just local trout club, um, by all means, shoot me an email at tcamisa at gmail.com, and I'll put you in contact with Matt so we can get all that stuff taken care of. He has tons of information. Trust me, we could have made 
hours and hours worth of videos and I hope that he does in the future because there's a lot in there. Trust me, everybody. So with that said, thank you so much for watching this fly tying tutorial-ish We'll call it the stream sample. If you'd like to watch more videos like this, you can check out my website, which is troutandfeather.com. I also have a, a Facebook and an Instagram under those same accounts. If you have any questions or comments, by all means, leave them down below in the comments section. You can email me also at tkamisa at gmail.com. Once again, Matt, thank you so much for coming thank you on. Thank very much, Jeff. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Good to be here. And in, uh, everybody. Undisclosed fishing location. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to tell you. In fact, we'll probably have to blur out the background too. Oh, you could do that. <laughs> we'll see all of you next time.